This devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus that we celebrate today is a very important devotion for us to have. As our Lord said to St. Margaret Mary, this was his last and best effort to inflame the hearts of mankind with his love. And I think each of us, if we look into our own heart, we can see that this is really what we need the most, something to draw us out of our lukewarmness and our apathy. And that is precisely what this devotion is and what it's intended for. This is something intended specifically for us. We can see in the revelations of the Sacred Heart of Jesus to St. Margaret Mary that our Lord complained about the injury and the dishonor that he suffered from our sins. And certainly he was talking about the sins of heretics and unbelievers, but he was talking also about the sins of Catholics too. And this devotion is something that he gave to the members of his church. And this means that the main thing that he was complaining about was the sins that his own friends in his church would commit against him, especially people who believed and understood how much our Lord loved them and yet continued to sin against him. These are the most serious and the most offensive sins of all in the sight of God. And this is something that we should understand. If we are hated or misunderstood by people who are our enemies or are, are just strangers to us, that's, that's one thing, but to be offended by people who are close to us is much, much worse. And we should especially think today about how sad our Lord must be that his enemies are so much more zealous and energetic in sinning against him than his friends are in, in loving him and in showing him honor. This is a sad fact, but it's very true when you look at it. And our Lord experienced this even during his life on earth. Towards the end of his life, when his passion was drawing near, he said to his apostles that one of them was going to betray him, and they would all abandon him that same night in the Garden of Olives. St. Peter didn't believe this, and he objected that even if everyone else left our Lord, he wouldn't. And he would even die for him if he had to. And our Lord said to him with great sorrow that before the rooster crowed three times, St. Peter would deny him. And our Lord told the apostles to watch and pray in the, in the, garden, of, in the, uh, the garden of Olives, but they wouldn't stay awake. They kept falling asleep. But during all of that time, when his friends were sleeping, our Lord's enemies were not asleep. Judas was on his way to the Pharisees, and he was bringing them back to arrest him. And the high priests and, and the scribes and the members of the council were not sleeping at all. They were instead in the house of Caiaphas, preparing to put our Lord on trial, bribing witnesses and, and so on. And when our Lord was arrested, of course, all of his apostles fled as he predicted. And even after our Lord was arrested, the trial lasted until the wee hours of the morning. But the next day, his enemies were up bright and early to put him to death. Our Lord experienced a lot of things like this during his life on earth, and, and things haven't changed since then. If we look around us in the world today, who do we see with the most zeal? Is it our Lord's friends? trying to serve him, trying to spread devotion to him? Or is it his enemies, those who are destroying any faith and belief in God that's left in the world? It is true that there are a few devoted souls doing everything they can to spread the kingdom of Christ. But for everyone like that, there are many, many more of his enemies. And in fact, there are many more also lukewarm Catholics. And the number of our Lord's enemies that are persecuting him is much greater than the number of his friends. 
We see this every day when we look at the world around us. It's just full of people that hate our Lord and who hate divine revelation. And it's very rare to find anyone who really loves Christ and wants to follow him and keep his law. And we even see people who pretend to be members of the Catholic Church and pretend to be followers of Christ who are ex in exactly the same boat, who actually persecute Christ with their sins and reject his teachings. Of course, this situation has become drastically worse since Vatican II, but it's not by any means a new problem in the world. For the last several centuries, the Church has been telling Catholics over and over again that they are not allowed to be members of the Freemasons or the Communists or any other societies that exist only for the purpose of destroying the Catholic faith. It's bad enough that the Church would even have to tell Catholics something like this in the first place. But then look at how few Catholics follow those commands and we see how dire the situation in the world is and how it has been for, for centuries now. Even now, when we look at Catholics who are members of the Church in good standing, we see even among those people, so many people who are, are comfortable doing only the minimum, who don't want to do anything extra for our Lord or His Sacred Heart. The only time we see these people getting energized about anything is when someone tries to get them to do a little bit more for Christ, and they, they object very strenuously. And the whole time, just like on the night that our Lord was arrested, his enemies are not looking to be comfortable or lazy. They're the most energetic people of all. And they work day and night to destroy our Lord's kingdom on earth. We should think about the warning of our Lord on this subject. He said, I would that thou wert cold or hot, but because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I am going to vomit thee out of my mouth. If we are looking for some sort of comfortable mediocrity in the service of, of our Lord, that means that we are worse off than his enemies. We are in greater danger of our souls. But this is really how our Lord feels towards his disciples who want the reward of following him but they don't want to make any effort or sacrifice. They just want to sit back and, and watch our Lord's kingdom get torn down by his enemies and do nothing. And even in our own daily lives, how often do we sit by and listen passively when people attack the church or more commonly attack Catholic morality and we say nothing and allow them to do this? We have to choose one or the other. We can't follow both Christ and the world, which is his enemies. It says in the book of Ecclesiasticus, Come not to the Lord with a double heart. Woe to him that is of a double heart and that walks two ways on the earth. That means that we can't live double lives. In fact, our Lord was very insistent that we can't follow him. We can't really be worthy of his kingdom if we don't put all of our effort into it, into his service. He said, no man can serve two masters. No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is worthy of the kingdom of God. If we start following Christ and we look back at the world and our sins and we look at, at human respect, then that's not following Christ the way he wants. If we try to calculate exactly how much we have to do for Christ, then automatically we are not doing enough. And our Lord didn't say these things to just, just a few people, just to his chosen apostles, or just to people who wanted to walk in the path of perfection. He said these things to just the crowds of people that were milling around him in the streets. And he even said, 
If anyone come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Now, of course, we're not supposed to hate anybody, but what he means is that if our family or friends or our co-workers or our, our possessions, goods of this world or anything else come between us and God or attempt to take us away from God, we have to oppose them, we have to reject them. Of course, our Lord didn't say that any of this was easy. So we should, we should think about, is this sacrifice really worth it, what our Lord is asking from us? To answer that, we only have to consider that God is the infinite good, and he offers himself to us as our eternal reward for his service. Everything else, all other created things, are, are tiny and, and they're, they're, they're perishable. If we prefer to have some creature of this world rather than to have God, what we are doing is we are rejecting the infinite good for some tiny created perishable good. And now someone might say, of course I do value God above all things. I want to save my soul, of course. But at the same time, I want to have a good time here on earth too. But this is lukewarmness again. If someone says that, what they are saying essentially is that God is not enough for them. They want God and they want creatures too. But in fact, it's only God that can fulfill all of our desires. Creatures will never satisfy us. So it's, it's a very foolish thing to attempt this. Of course, we're not forbidden to have the things of this world. But we have to love God with our whole heart and our whole strength. Not just with part of our heart. We can't love anything on earth if it'll interfere with our love of God. Again, this is all a lot to ask, and our Lord is upfront about this. He, he's, uh, he's straightforward about it, and he understands that he is asking a lot from us. But if we think about it, let us look at what he has done for us. Did he put any limit to the love that he had for us? No, not at all. We see him from the beginning of his life, sacrificing everything that he had for our sake. He was born in a stable. He deprived himself of all of the glory that he had as the Son of God in order to become man. And he didn't just become an average person. He became one of the poorest people in the whole world who didn't have a place of his own. And he lived his whole life sacrificing himself for us. And finally, at the end of his life, when he dies for us on the cross, in terrible agony, and shed the last drop of his blood, enduring every form of pain to a degree we could never even imagine, we see how much he really loves us. And when we think about all of this, it should help us to understand how terrible it is to our Lord when we ask ourselves if, if we really can do everything that he is asking from us. We should have a generosity towards him that corresponds at least in some way with the generosity that he has had towards us. This is why our Lord expects us to be generous with him and why we should never just try to calculate what we can what will be the, the minimum amount that we can do in terms of serving him. And that is where devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus comes in. In this apparition, our Lord showed us that he gave us his whole heart. And he only asks us to do the same for him. That is what this devotion is all about. So let us think today about the love that our Lord has shown us and have greater zeal in wanting to love and serve him in return.
It is the least that we can do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.